Today's speaker, I had an opportunity to meet Jeff, uh, I don't know, six, eight months ago. Um, he has a horse ranch south of town here. And, and I, I don't want to steal any of this thunder. I'm not sure how much he's going to talk about that. But afterwards, if you guys have an opportunity, come up and visit and see what he does over there because it's a tremendous, tremendous equestrian, um, I don't know how you refer to it, helping youth. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of one of the best kept secrets that I've heard of lately. So Jeff is going to share uh, his life, his story, from prison to pardon to purpose, and uh, mm -hmm. give it up for Jeff Jackson. Well, good afternoon. Uh, so, by the end of the by the end of the um, our time together, I'm I'm hopefully going to be able to share with you and communicate with you the passion that I have uh, for a program called Acres for Joy, and and our intent to change the world in the lives of youth in the Chippewa Valley, and specifically youth with uh, additional burden and as you know you don't have to go very far uh, to find that category um, and it was in the context of my sharing that passion with um, uh, John Polzine and with Rich um, <clears throat> that I I gave a little bit of the backstory uh, as to the depth of that passion and that's the context in which they asked if I ever spoke about that and I I responded by saying, uh, uh, not really, at least not, not at, and, and, and so a month ago, well, okay, so th there was the origins of the invitation. And then uh, when they called and invited me, um, I was, uh, was eager, uh, and then I visited last month for the first time, and that helped bring uh, a solemnity to me, right, a real sense of uh, um, trepidation, all right? Well, listen, what we're going to do, here, here's what I'd like to do. I want to I do a quick overview of the journey that I've been on. And then I want to talk about what I call the dramatic reality. And then I want to look at parallels that we're going to have in common. And then, I'm, then, following that, I'd like to speak a little bit about Acres for Joy. Uh, Redeemed and Grateful, that's the title I gave it. Um, oh, I, sh I should also say, um, I'm, well, I'll come to it in here, but I would let you know that I've been back in the community since 1990. I'm a physician assistant. Um, uh, I've worked with Sacred Heart Hospital uh, uh, for the last 24 years, but I've been with the university in Marshfield. And it's my privilege to serve um, in, in the realm of behavioral health. I am a physician assistant working in psychiatry, and uh, it's my privilege to be the medical provider at the Eau Claire Academy for the last 16 years. And I want you to just pause for a second and just think for a moment about the context and the clientele that I see and serve on a regular basis. Behavioral health, the Eau Claire Academy. And uh, I tell you, it's a, it's a great opportunity um, and we'll come to that a, a little bit more. Um, I'm an Eau Claire native. I, I grew up on uh, the west side of Eau Claire. I grew up on, primarily on Vine Street in an upstairs apartment with my mother and, and two sisters. Um, I attended Central uh, High School back then. I think it was called high school. I was in the seventh and eighth grade. Uh, and then from there I went to DeLong. But after the school one day, and at the eighth grade, I walked downtown. And on the corner of Barstow and Grand, right in front of, it was uh, Walgreens, uh, there were two women standing there, college women, uh, uh, Nancy and Mary. And they were handing out tracts, little tracts about uh, faith in Jesus Christ. And they engaged me in conversation. And I went right from there to 1022 South Oxford Avenue, where there was a Jesus people house at the time. I was a 13-year-old kid. And, and I, I went right over there and I met some of the people, college people that lived there and they spoke to me about Christianity and about the gospel. And of course, and 
and it, what, I, what I sensed was my welcome, my inclusion, how kind they were to me. Well, two weeks later, I went back, and, and a man named Randy Berdahl shared the gospel with me. And even at the age of 13, I didn't need convincing about my personal need. I already was aware of that. But on that day, what he showed me in the scripture was the kindness and grace of God towards me. And in, in simplicity, uh, we kneeled down next to a couch, and I asked the Lord to be my Savior. And I was 13 years old, and my understanding was very minimal. But I went forward with zeal, and for about six months, if you were anywhere around me, I was going to talk to you about the need to be born again. And I was going to talk about John 3.16. And, and, and I, I, was, uh, I was clearly affected. Well, envision this. Uh, an unstable home life. A 13-year-old kid, a lot of energy. And now a theme that is not necessarily well received by all my friends. Uh, and and it, it wasn't too long. And my visits to what was called the House of David... Uh, my visits down to that, that house for Bible study diminished, and, and <clears throat> pretty soon I, I just, it, it wasn't on my radar. Well, as time went on, uh, you know, my note here is uh, I demonstrated youthful unsteadiness, and, and that's true, and, and energy. And I, I think I was a pretty happy kid, and I was involved in a bunch of stuff. But, but Christianity had kind of faded to the back for me. And as I finished up high school at North, uh, it was a, a, a remarkable thing that I began to smoke marijuana. You know, nowadays that's tremendously common. Back then it was pretty common, but it was a clear corner, a clear turning in my life. And before long, uh, that's something that I enjoyed doing very much, for, I think for a variety of reasons. And one of it was because it was an insulation to some of the challenges and struggles that I had. But, I, but that's the context which for me personally, it introduced me. Uh, unfortunately, my, my stepbrother introduced me then to a variety of other drugs that, that I was receptive to and interested in. I graduated from high school. A couple of my friends from Eau Claire moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, work at the Kawasaki shop, and said, Jeff, you ought to come down and we can party down here. And so that same uh, stepbrother and I headed to Nebraska. I think we got there on a Wednesday night. And on Thursday night, on Thursday night, one of the friends down there and myself um, took handguns, pistols, and held up a liquor store. And my motivation is I was interested in buying four pounds of marijuana, and I didn't have any money. So I have many positions on marijuana, but one of them is this. Its effect upon me was such that I thought it was a good idea to hold up a liquor store. I, I thought that was a good idea. They didn't talk me into it. It seemed like a good idea. Well, it, th that thought lasted a very short time because uh, a few hours later, we were apprehended and, um, and the process began. Uh, and, and first I was in, uh, you know, I was familiar with the story of the prodigal son from uh, earlier years. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm in uh, the Lincoln um, uh, County uh, crash, or, uh, uh, Jail, and, uh, and the process starts. And in a period of time, I, um, I received a sentence of three years. I was uh, 19 years old when that was given. It was a, a flat three, uh, just a three-year sentence. And back then, if, if you stayed out of trouble, if you kept your good time, that you, um, you could get out in 23 months. Now, I've asked you to stop and think for a minute of the clientele that I serve and, and the gravity of the conditions that come before me. And I'd invite you also to pause for a minute and think about a 19-year-old kid going into the Lincoln uh, Penal and Correctional Complex, initially behind the wall, which is the maximum security area for a period of evaluation, and then a medium security, and then a work release. And while three years for some down there, it didn't seem to be that much. For me, it was stunning, it was striking, it was, it, it clearly caught my attention. You know, I didn't come from a family of criminals. As far as I know, I'm the first one in the family. Um, 
And so, um, as, you'll, as you could appreciate, I, I was embarrassed, I was afraid, had my attention. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll say a little bit later, I was repentant uh, in a real way. Well, I, as I served that time and as I, as I struggled through that, I came to my time to be in a work release program. And that's where you, you go to a, a lesser restriction, you get a job. And uh, there's a man, Fred Kirshner. He owned uh, Nebraska Land Meats. And it's interesting how it happened, but I ended up in Fred's, uh, in Fred's office. And he said, tell me your story. And I told him, and I was very honest. I told him I was from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I'm, right now I'm in Norfolk, Nebraska. That's where he was. I'm from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and I, I, I laid the story out. And Fred talked to me for 45 minutes. And what came of that was a job offer at the meat plant. And, uh, uh, and I started packing meat. That was my job. And then I was a butcher. And Fred befriended me. And within nine months, he gave me keys to the plant because I became a night cleanup man. And when he offered me a job, I worked for him for three and a half years, he befriended me. The day I got out, he and his wife picked me up, picked me up on March 9th, 1980. Went to the grocery store and got me a bag of groceries and took me to an apartment, a downstairs basement apartment. And, um, and I stayed, I chose, it was a huge decision for me. I, I got out of prison and I wanted to come home so badly. But I knew that my friends were still partying and I knew that if, if I came back, it was Jackson's out of prison, let's party. And it was a, a conscious thing for me that I said, I can't, I can't do that. I, I mean, so many processes going on, but stepping out a felon, no small thing. Shortly thereafter, I was befriended by a man named Gary Schald. Had a little house church in his house. And, I mean, it wasn't his. It was a group of people that met there. But Gary had a story a little similar to mine. A, a, a man of recovery. A man of substance uh, involvement and recovery. And a, and a friend, and he befriended me. And the effect upon my life, as you're going to hear, is, is striking. Well, I joined that small, that small church, and they welcomed me. I was instructed. I was discipled. I was helped. I ended up living with a couple, and, and he was an accountant, Roger, and she was uh, a nurse, and they brought me in to disciple me, I mean, because he, here's this, this fellow just got out of prison, and he's got a lot of energy, and, he's in, and, and his judgment is yet developing. And it was Maureen Dirks, Rini, who said to me, Jeff, you ought to go to school. <laughs> and I said, school? I said, Rini, what could I go to school for? And she said, well, maybe, maybe you could be a nurse. And well, I don't know anything about nursing. But that started a process. And she went with me down to, down to uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And I applied to nursing school. And I got accepted. And as I completed the RN program, I applied to the physician assistant program across the street, and I got accepted. And I went through that program. Near that time, I was married. I've been married for 35 years. I was married to Margaret near that time. We were in fellowship in a church in Omaha. I took employment at a state psychiatric hospital in Norfolk, Nebraska. And how about this? Remember. The, the, men, the old mental health uh, county home setting where you had a big piece of property and all these buildings around, and then with, with deinstitutionalization, they became empty, right? So the mental health, they, they, and that's what happened in Norfolk. Well, there were two buildings out of, out of, there were two buildings out of six that were still housed. The first was the mental health hospital. The last was the work release program. I had lived at that work release program and ate meals at the mental health hospital all of it for 14 months while I worked for Fred Kirshner. And when I got out of college, my first job was at that mental health hospital and my office looked out across the yard at the house where I used to live or the, the setting. As time went on, I, I wanted to come home and I, but remember I'm a felon and, and I ended up, I applied for a pardon. I applied to the pardon board, and we're going to visit that in a little bit. And by the grace of God, I received a pardon. Returned home in 1990 and have been in the community since. We have four daughters. 
four wonderful daughters. My fourth is in the back corner there, and I'm grateful for her help getting this together today. Um, I want to say a word about, uh, I just failed to bring my clock, so I want to make sure I'm not, there you go, thank you. Um, I want to say a word about my second daughter, Abigail Joy, Abigail Joy Jackson. The name Abigail means the source of joy, Abigail Joy Jackson, a wonderful, wonderful girl who at the age of nine developed type 1 diabetes. And by the age of 14, had <coughs> developed a lot of confusion about body image. And that's commonly known as, a, as an eating disorder. And here was our beloved Abby with, with diabetes and an eating disorder. And trust me, that combination is, can be uh, very difficult to manage and, and uh, very troubling. And it wasn't always that way for Abby, but as time went on, it was multiple hospitalizations, ICU stays, um, and uh, the time came around 2004 that uh, if I were to tell you that we were a family in crisis, it, it would be a tremendous understatement. Wholeheartedly seeking to help Abby with her struggles, and yet it's not the kind of thing you can just reach in and fix. And but in 2004, I heard Kim Meter speak on Focus on the Family. Kim and Troy Meter have a horse ranch in Bend, Bend Oregon, 9.7 acres, and back then, 4,500 visits per year with kids. I believe Kim Meter has been the most popular speaker on Focus on the Family since that time, has been on time and time again. And as I traveled down the road and heard her speak, something in me was affected thinking of Abby, and we lived, we lived on Hewitt Street. We lived uh, next to Randy Schneider in town, and, and thinking about uh, horses. I, I didn't think about horses. And, and, um, uh, and some months later, Abby, as she struggled, she was hospitalized in Wickenburg, Arizona, at the Remuda Ranch, an equine assistant program. $1,550 a day, 134 days. Why would I say that price? Only to say this, that's the gravity. That's the gravity of the situation. And in that context, even the insurance company was willing to pay. And it was while visiting Abby at the Remuda Ranch that I heard Ward Keller, the founder, talk about his daughter and her struggles and about horse therapy and the difference that animals, but specifically horses, can make and that his daughter was alive and had survived. There a second time, my heart was moved. It was also at that visit that Miss Abby looked at me and said, Papa, can I get a horse? And I said, Abby, a horse? And she said, Papa, please. I said, Abby, I don't know anything about horses. Please, Papa. Well, I want to tell you, friends, in this situation, as in many in life, context is everything. And for a young girl to ask her father to get a horse is probably not a new thing. And in many contexts, you wouldn't sell your home and move to the country. But the context, my friend, is very different here. And I went away thinking about it. And as Abby got out of there and she continued to struggle, the time came that I, on a Saturday morning, I typed up two paragraphs. We're Jeff and Margaret Jackson. We live in the city. We want to move to the country. I'd like to buy five acres. We want to get a horse. And I went south of Eau Claire, down on Double H, because Lyle Bean, my good friend, lived there, had 500 acres, and said, Abby could ride on, on my land. And I thought, if we could live by Lyle. And on the eighth door, I found 29 acres. Vacant land. 1,000 gophers, that's it. <laughs> two, two weeks later, I bought a field of dreams. We had never, in 24 years of marriage at that time, not one time talked about building a house. And all of a sudden, we're talking about building a house, and we're talking about horses, and we're, we're beginning, it, we're going we're to make a shift here, because the course we're on is not working. And so it's a huge move, and, and the day we dug the hole for the house, Miss Abby was in Sacred Heart Hospital ICU. 
And I got a call that morning, and they didn't know that she'd make it. And by the grace of God, Abigail Joy Jackson came through the ICU, Sacred Heart Hospital, October of 2004. And from there, my beloved daughter was placed at Winnebago State Psychiatric Hospital by Eau Claire County, and where she was safe. And we built and dreamed, and Abby read Horses for Dummies. And I said, Abby, what kind of horse do you want? She said, Papa, I want a Clydesdale. <laughs> and I said, a Clydesdale? And she said, Papa, they're, they're gentle. You can ride them and they pull. Please, Papa. And I said, well, let's just think about this. And two weeks later, she said to me, Papa, wouldn't it be something if we could get two? <laughs> and we'd name them Clyde and Dale. And then by now, you know what I said. Well, let's just think about that. <laughs> and friends, so away we went. We built a house and we, we, um, we celebrated that Abby was safe at Winnebago. Albeit, I want to tell you, Winnebago State Psychiatric Hospital is the other end of the spectrum from the Remuda Ranch in Wickenburg, Arizona. We moved in in, in May of 05. Had a driveway and a house. No yard, no horses, nothing. Abby came home in July. Ten weeks later, she went to Memorial High School for her first day of her senior year. Now this is a girl who, remember, all these hospitalizations. Think of the social disruption. I mean, just, just, just the tremendous variability. The next day was her birthday. And that day I took her to Sacred Heart um, because she was so sick that we, Margaret and I went to buy her a car in Minneapolis and when we came home with the car, Abby was so sick that, that she said, Papa, I need to go to the hospital. And I took her to Sacred Heart and um, seven days later, on September 11th of 2005, uh, she passed away. Of a, um, <clears throat> of a bad infection related to her medical condition. And um, that uh, opened the door for a time of, uh, simply what I'll say, of great sorrow. Um, and in the midst of that great sorrow came a steady resolve. You see, I it really looked like the doors were opening for that field. I'd heard Kim Meter speak and I'd caught wind. Friends, I already, I already knew the need. Look at what I work in, I, I knew the need. And I caught wind of some help through animals, and not just animals, but it's people and animals helping children. And I caught wind of that, and, but I also, I had to do something with, I had to do something, I had to do something. I was not at liberty to not do anything. And so a steady resolve came that we were going to continue to pursue and to develop what we saw. Now, what we saw back then is different than all that we see now. But it was a direction. And friends, what happened to that field? We've been taming that field for 14 years. The gopher number is down, but it's not eradicated. But I can tell you this. Tens of thousands of footprints, hoof prints, and paw prints, hundreds of children. It's been our privilege to host kids from the Eau Claire Academy over 230 times in the last six years. We have a, a cluster of kids with type one diabetes that we host no charge to them or their families once a month. We've done summer school with South Middle School for the last four years. If you get tapped on the shoulder to come to summer school, you're coming to Acres for Joy if you're at South, and, and I'm, I'm helping lead the conversation. And I tell them right up front that you've been chosen to be here because we see leadership quality in you. And we want to coach you up. And we're not going to talk about reading, writing, and arithmetic. Right? You need that. You'll get that. But friends, we're going to talk about how do you go from ordinary to extraordinary. How do your dreams come true? We're going to talk about the importance of character and integrity.
The importance of relationship skills. The importance of attitude. Choices and consequences. Boundaries and barriers. And what we're going to do at Acres for Joy is that we're going to use what we call equine assisted learning. If you, if you brought me into the library at South Middle School and had me talk about those topics, you get one response. But if we bring them out to the ranch and we engage them with animals and horses and goats and chickens, and yesterday, yesterday, uh, six middle school kids and I caught the final duck that I could not get off the pond. He would not come near. The fish net that I have previously tried to use had frightened him. And so we're on a frozen pond. I'm on a frozen pond yesterday coaching this duck in. So there's all kinds of settings, but um, by way of this, I, I would, so in, in light of the overview, what, what you've heard is you've heard about Acres for Joy. I'm the proud father of four, uh, four daughters. And uh, you know the one verse when Abby passed away, and there's been many verses, but I want to tell you the anchor, the, the core, the, the, the one where I could plant my foot. It's when the Lord Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And he who lives and believes in me will never die. And I want to tell you, friends, finding footing in that time was remarkably difficult. And I'm so grateful for many things, and certainly that is one of them. All right, now we'll go a little bit quicker. So we had the overview, and now I want to talk about what I call the dramatic reality. The dramatic reality, prison, pardon, purpose, no small thing, any of those. And here's where I'd comment on prison. It was an appropriate consequence for me. It was an appropriate consequence. It was a time of repentance. I had become a Christian when I was 13 years old. I had backslidden. I had engaged myself in things I shouldn't have been doing. And like the prodigal son, I had come to the place where I was tremendously narrowed and unhappy. And in that place, in that place, once again, I found the grace of God. And I found forgiveness. And I found a burden of my heart roll away. I was lonely. I was embarrassed. And I learned to be vigilant. Indeed, it was a place of learning for me. It was in that setting. I wasn't a very good reader. I hadn't done real good in school. I was so bored that I read a few things. And it's in that setting that I found a poem. A poem. I was so bored I was reading. I found a poem. And I have shared this hundreds of times. And I greatly value it. One ship sails east and another sails west with the selfsame winds that blow. Tis the set of the sail, and not the gale, that tells it the way to go. Like the winds of the sea are the winds of time as we travel along through life. Tis the set of the soul that decides the goal, and not the calm or the strife. And friends, what that meant to me was this. 19 years old, convicted of armed robbery, a felon, incarcerated, humiliated, the future unsure and what I saw there because I also read a reader's digest and I heard about a, I read about a judge who had who had had, a, had some problems and he ended up becoming a judge and that those two things I saw the very same pressure the very same wind that blows the ship one goes that way one goes that way what's the difference it's the set of the sail, it's the rudder, it's the navigation of the wind. And in my life, friends, the wind was a troubled beginning. It was, at that point, it was being a felon, being incarcerated. This is the wind, the pressure that's driving. And what I saw is that it didn't have to determine the outcome. I didn't have to go back to prison time and time again, which I was, I was you know, cellmates, you might say, with ones who had been doing that. And I caught wind that the wind, I caught wind that it was possible to navigate 
even in a very difficult situation. And friends, when we talk about attitude at Acres for Joy, I've got a model ship that I put in front of these kids. And I don't know what all their wind is, because it's, it's not my role to investigate their difficulties. But I know that if you're coming out there in this program, very, amongst them are definite difficulties. So um, I also want to tell you this, the second best thing, I owe, I owe a debt of gratitude to the state of Nebraska. Because the second best thing that ever happened to me was that they stepped in front of me. When I begged to go home in the courtroom, I, when I, I made it clear, I, I don't want to go to jail. And he said, young man, and I tell you what, he did me a kindness. The state of Nebraska stepped in front of me and said, you need to slow down. And that was a kindness to me. The second best thing ever happened to me is I went to prison. The first best thing is that Mary and Nancy spoke to me on the corner of Barstow and Grand, and Gary Bredahl took the time and the interest in my life to talk to me about the love of God. And you say, well, what about getting married? Isn't that supposed to be it? Well, friends, without the first and without the second, I got nothing to bring to the table for the third. Okay, the dramatic reality, prison. Next. The dramatic reality, pardon. I applied for a pardon. The event was in the Capitol building, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. You can appreciate, you know, it's the kind of thing you put a tie on for, you clean up, you go down there and it, you walk in and it's, it's you know, it's a, a, a kind of a courtroom, meeting room, Capitol room setting. And the, the um, Governor K. Orr, uh, Alan Bierman, and um, Attorney General Robert Spire, the Attorney General, the uh, Secretary of State, and the Governor of Nebraska. And then I present, and I've, I've already given them information ahead of time that they've reviewed, and then they question me and talk to me. And uh, a salient point uh, during that time, a striking, a striking thing is I'm asking for this. Now remember, by then I'm a registered nurse, a physician assistant, I've been involved with a, a group of Christians for years. Um, I'd stayed out of trouble. Um, my wife was there with our daughter, and um, I remember the Attorney General saying, Mr. Jackson, I have a letter here from Sergeant so-and-so from Lancaster County opposing the restoration of your gun rights. Do you have anything to say? And my response was, sir, all that the Sergeant knows about me is that I committed an armed robbery in November of 1977. What he doesn't know is all the information I've presented to you here. And he said, do I understand you to be asking for your gun rights back? And the governor said, Alan, full restoration. He's asking for full restoration. And three minutes later, they all voted for full restoration with the restoration of gun rights, which you can appreciate as a felon, as an armed robber. That was, that was really something I took note of. They asked me why I wanted the pardon, and I, I was candid, I was clear. I said I made a terrible mistake, and I went to prison for it, and I served my time, and I've been working hard to do everything I can to put that behind me. And I want to go home, I want to go back to Wisconsin, I want to go to Eau Claire, and I'd like to put that to rest as best I can. And um, they agreed with that. Now let me read it to you, if you will. I'll be, I think we're doing fine. I'd like to read the pardon because there's a couple of words I want you to hear. Know all men by these presents, whereas Jeffrey Jackson was here, heretofore convicted of the following Nebraska offense, convicted in the District Court of Lancaster County, Nebraska, for the offense of robbery on the 17th day of March, 1978, and sentenced on the 6th day of June, and that goes on. Whereas the Board of Pardons did consider such application at its meeting of December 2nd. Whereas upon consideration of the application and the evidence submitted in support thereof, the Board did find that the said Jeffrey Jackson is a fit subject for clemency. That the public good would be served by granting such application and that a full pardon should be bestowed by the government through its duly authorized officers as an act of grace 
and further found that insofar as the offense here, herein involved is concerned, the governor should be empowered to expressly authorize the said Jeffrey Jackson to receive, possess, and transport in commerce firearms. Now therefore, the Board of Pardons of the State of Nebraska, by virtue of the authority vested in it, and by the Constitution and the laws of the State of Nebraska, does hereby, par uh, does hereby grant a full pardon to Jeffrey Jackson for the offense, set up, the offense above set forth, and he is freely and unconditionally absolved from all the legal consequences of his offense and of his conviction, including both direct and collateral consequences, as such offense is forgiven and remitted by virtue of the sovereign power conferred upon the undersigned. And then it goes on. Friends, it was a striking, it was a striking day. It was a remarkable day. I thought I had a picture. I'm not sure I do, so we'll see. It might be there. I want to draw your attention to the words, clemency, mercy, leniency. How about this? It says that as an act of grace, freely and unconditionally absolved, such offense is forgiven. And friends, for those of us who are Christians, those words mean something to us. We love those words, right? We love guilt being well established. The concept, the gift of grace, of leniency and mercy and forgiveness and being absolved. But I, I want to comment. There is, um, and while I see a parallel here, let me also add this. Remember what they said? The reason, in part, why they offered that to me is because I was deemed to be a fit subject for clemency. And therefore, the, the state of Nebraska pardoned me. But friends, we all know that the pardon that we enjoy together is not based upon us being fit subjects for clemency. Friends, it's as you know, it's based upon us being unfit subjects and his fitness, his clemency, his leniency, his kindness. So there's parallels here, but that's, that's one we've got to be real clear on. All right. Next, the dramatic reality. Purpose. It's dramatic. It's dramatic to go to prison. And it is dramatic to get a pardon. And it is dramatic to be drawn into purpose. What was the purpose? What was the intent of the pardon? In part, this was the intent. You're deemed to be fit for clemency. We want to unencumber you as you go forward. We want, we want this not to affect you. In reference to this offense that you did here, we forgive you, it's over, it's behind you. We want you to go forward and, and prosper and not be limited by this. That's at the heart of the intent of that pardon. And friends, as you see, intent accomplished. Intent accomplished. I wish I could see that pardon board again and thank them. I wish I could speak to the state of Nebraska and thank them for interrupting my way. Because the intent of that pardon, I was able to come home and, I'm, you know, I'm a medical professional. I, I, I'm a prescriber. I write controlled substances all, all day long. And, and on these applications, of course I have to write, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And you know, it's, it's, you're embarrassed about that. But they allowed me the privilege to be able to say, yes, I have been. And, but then to be able to say, pardoned, forgiven. Doesn't mean I didn't do it. But it means that the issue is as settled as it can be uh, in this setting. And as I, I guess as I get just to this point, because I, I commented on returning home, I tell you, in this room is a man who hired me over the phone, to whom I'm tremendously grateful, uh, Mark Anderson. He hired me over the phone when I came back in 1990. Been married for 35 years. We have four, four wonderful daughters, five grandkids. I've been a physician assistant 33 years. I serve in behavioral health. It's my privilege. I'm not there by default. 
I've been in family practice for 10 years in urgent care. Behavioral health is dear to my heart and the people I serve and that I help. Um, and my wife and I have co-founded Acres for Joy. When Abby left, after Abby passed away, um, her good friend visited us maybe a year later. A friend from Winnebago State Psychiatric Hospital came. Very emotional time for me. And, and Sarah was her name. And Sarah said to me that as Abby was being released, now think of this, my dear daughter with, with a host of troubles, as she was being released, she wanted, to, she wanted to come home and she wanted to change the world. Well, I'm, I've caught wind of that. And um, I, I like that. And that's what we're set upon doing. And friends, as we built this little horse ranch, and as I got educated in horses, we bought one, then we bought two. You know, at one point we had 18, and we got minis and donkeys and goats and all of this. From Hewitt Street out to the country, 29 acres has grown to 50 acres because I thought, friends, I just could not believe. I could not find a way to deal with this being allowed to happen. Where is God in this? And, and I, I chose to believe that it has been allowed for a higher purpose and that we might take the wind from that sorrow and channel it and funnel it and use it and do something with it. And so when I had opportunity to buy seven acres on this side, I, we bought it. And 14 acres on this side, we bought it. Because my vision for that field was that it would be a place of, of broad service to youth. We haven't yet seen the fruition. I'll be honest with you. I'm hoping in this crowd there's some of you that want to come out and take a look at what we're doing. I'm, I'm proud to say that, that Sandy Polzine is on our board and she's caught wind of it. I'm proud to tell you that two Mondays, uh, two Mondays ago I spoke to the Eau Claire County, correction, the Eau Claire School Board for 45 minutes. And they've got some real interest and energy in what we're doing with kids because we've been serving their kids and there's been remarkable things. All right, let's go just a little further. Parallels. Parallels. Got to go faster and I will. What I want to say is this. Incarceration in, in Lincoln, Nebraska was the softest of the limitations and shacklings that I've known. It was dramatic. It was terrible. It changed my life. But I was also that Christian group in Nebraska that helped me, and they helped me a lot. They helped us. But I also was hindered there because I came out of that group with an exclusive mentality. There was this thought that the light shines brightest with us, with our group, that we are the group. And I absorbed that. And so when I came back to Eau Claire, I had this exclusive mentality that, that limited my ability to interact with with other Christians freely. I was not released from those tentacles until the wind was utterly kicked out of me on September 11th of 2005 when Abigail passed away. And thereafter, those themes that I held so tightly that I thought were so important just didn't have the same. And then I was drawn into another kind of bondage and entanglement. And friends, there's a period of grief and sorrow and remorse. And like Peter, hounded by guilt. And thankfully, like Peter, being delivered by truth. Um, and friends, what parallel I see is that substances are, are like this. There's all kinds of things that shackle us, that limit us, that, that take away our confidence, that diminish our ability to have clear eye contact and engagement. Friends, that discourage us. Discouragement is, is so monstrous and so limiting. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way. But I was none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow. 
and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Friends, one of the main things I learned that in my life, in Jeff Jackson's life, shackled by legalism, an attitude like that, what I needed was a little less talk and a lot more action. Pardon to purpose. Remember? The purpose, the purpose of the pardon. Oh, I hate to even. The purpose of the pardon was that I might go forth unencumbered. And friends, the, I, I want to suggest to you and say to you, the purpose of the pardon that we enjoy is the same. Look at this. Titus. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. His intent was to redeem us and purify us for himself that we might be zealous for good works. Titus 3, and let our, and let our people also learn to engage in good deeds, to meet pressing needs. Or how about the King James? Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Friends, we're, we're charged, we're encouraged that we too might go forth and be engaged in purpose. We love Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, don't we? For by grace you're saved through faith that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But how about verse 10, the next verse? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that we should walk in them. Friends, delivered with intent, delivered with purpose, pardoned to purpose, that we might be engaged. And you know, friends, I want to tell you that years ago, you know, and that's part of the whole journey. How do you, okay, well, we agree with that. How do we figure that out? What do we do? How do we live our lives? And years ago, I would have had much more clarity as to how you should live your life. <laughs> But thank goodness I've been delivered from that. But what I have not been delivered from, I have not been freed. I have not been freed from using what I have as best I can for betterment. I'm not at liberty not to do that. Friends, I'm, we're called and we're, well, you see what I mean? All right, we're going to go. Reflections with gratitude. People have made a difference. Thank you, Mary and Nancy, for being at Barstow. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Fred Kirshner, 87 years old, living in Norfolk, Nebraska. Thank you, Fred. Changed my life. Thank you, Gary Schalt. The list goes on and on of people. You have a list, too, I'm sure. You have a list of ones who have helped you and intervened in your life, and you look back. And Chuck Swindoll would encourage all of us to thank those people, remember them, rekindle again, and thank them again. But friends, I also want to say to us right here, as those people have affected me, and if your list has affected you, we're right in the midst of it. We have that opportunity. We can make a difference. We can make a difference in, in young lives, in, in all kinds of lives. I'm grateful for the scripture. I bought this Bible when I was 13 years old down on Main Street. Very simple. It was a simple message. But it was through the word of God. It was many things. Here's one that, that counted for me. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor with his hands that he might have to give to those who have need. But it's through the scripture that I, I, I learned of the mercy and kindness and love of God. It's through the scripture that I, I learned of a higher calling and a higher engagement, a purpose for living. It was through the scripture that we've been drawn in. You know, it's, I want to say this. For years, I, I saw the gospel as primarily as a rescuing me from the pit or from darkness, rescuing me. And indeed, it does that. But beyond that, friends, it's an invitation. Rescued for what? Just to be able to say I'm rescued? Rescued to serve 
rescued to be vital, rescued to be purposeful. I'm grateful for songs. You know, how about this for irony? When I was behind the wall in Lincoln, Nebraska, a man named uh, Gary Vaness, he was a believer, we sang a song together out by the yard, and this is it. Jesus signed my pardon, this I surely know. Took my place on Calvary, now I don't have to go. All my life I give him, he gave his for me. When he signed my pardon there on Calvary. Or how about this one? One there is above all others. Well deserves the name of friend. His is love beyond a brother's, costly, free, and knows no end. They who once his kindness prove, find it everlasting love. Which of all your friends to save you could or would have shed his blood? Christ the Savior died to have you reconciled in him to God. This, I, I'm slipping, this is boundless love indeed. Jesus is a friend in need. I want to tell you the next one, but I can't. Time is too short. We've got to keep moving this. I'm grateful for the opportunity to recover. I'm grateful. Well, I have to tell you. I'm grateful for F.B. Meyer, who wrote a book called Present Tenses. And he wrote a chapter on, on Matthew 28 when the Lord Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. And the book is called Present Tenses. And here's what he said. The Lord Jesus didn't say, Lo, I was with you. Lo, I will be with you. Present tense, lo, I am with you. And when I read that, I paused and I said, Lord, every day? Yes. I said, even that day? Even that day, Lord? And he said, yes. And friends, I've been helped by that. And I've been helped by many a book. I've been helped by my family. I've been helped by Acres for Joy. I, I'm sorry, I, I have to go quickly. I want to quick show you. I want to show you. This is uh, up in the left. This is... Uh, my wife and my three remaining daughters, when Lydia got married, and Cody, he's back here. Down on the right, there's three of the five grandkids. Uh, and then uh, that's David and Joanna. They're down in Texas. And, uh, you know, if you're going to say to me, well, Jeff, look, at you just showed all this, these pictures are all about the kids. I tell you, my daughter, Joanna, who has five, would say, Dad, it's all about the kids. You know, the first three are wonderful. They wanted four. And what came along was a pair of twins that are now two years old. All right? Uh, Abigail Joy, my friends. We're changing the world together. Just, I could put, I could put thousands of pictures up here. I only wanted to show you a few. Robbins Elementary Special Education Group. This is our summer school group. Uh, in this picture, I think there's six kids with type 1 diabetes. All right, we're going to close. Just, I'm real close. When Rich, when he first invited me, it was in the context of Acres for Joy. And I can talk about that at length. But then, when we talked more, he wanted me to tell a little bit more of the backstory. And then I felt a little nervous. And I felt, I felt um, inadequate. I felt guilty. Because friends, you've heard some of the story, but of course there's other things. This, this, this journey that we're on is full of all kinds of stuff. There's things that work out well, and there's things that don't work out as well. But you know, when I, so I paused, and I thought, Lord, this invitation, I mean, I, and th this is what came to me. This quick what came to me. A verse that I absolutely love, Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah was directed down to the potter's house that he might observe what the potter made upon his wheel. And it says this, and the vessel that was made was marred in the hand of the potter. That's King James. The vessel he made was marred. It was spoiled in the hand of the potter. The next sentence, so he made it again into another vessel. And that's the verse that flashed in my mind in the, in the context of inadequacy. Do you know what, friends? Marred. That's what I am. You've heard some of it. There's a lot more. Marred. But time and time again, what I have found is the grace of God making it again working again. And I know this in this room, we're marred. We're spoiled. It didn't all work out the way we thought it should and wanted it to. But my testimony is that is I have found the help of God in prison, in legalism, 
and, and, and legalism and the, the devastating consequences that has upon relationships and perspectives. And I tell you what, that's not the way to raise four daughters. It's not the way to, to maintain a healthy marriage. But I found the grace of God in that. And friends, I found the grace of God making again in sorrow. The captivity of sorrow. And then, here we go. This is on my library wall. Let us never listen to the lie that our past is only a prophecy of our future. But instead, by the reception of the strong and full life of Jesus Christ, let us say, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Friends, we love that, that verse, don't we? We love that verse. But I love that first part. Let us never believe the lie that our past is only a prophecy of our future. Friends, there's, there's help, and the past can be changed, and the future can be different. And let me close with this. Hopefully together we can say, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Um, absolute lastly, I would tell you that a pitch for Acres for Joy. I'd like you to look at us. We've got a website. We've got a great board of directors. We're, we're getting after making a difference. Uh, there's a handout about our programs, and there's a handout about our beginnings. And I would tell you about this, this one. It took me 14 years to write it, and uh, it's only one page. It'll help you understand this better. Thank you so much. One question. How many Clydesdales do you have? <laughs> so about six years ago, <laughs> six years ago, my Amish friend called. He knew the story, and here's the message he left on my phone. Yeah, Jeff? Yeah, Jeff, this is Joe's. I'm at the Nielsville Horse Auction, and I just bought a pair of Clydesdale Welch Pony Crosses for you. Could you call me? <laughs> Clydesdale, my friend, Clydesdale.